Nearly 400 monkey skulls from Cameroon were intercepted at Paris Roissy Charles de Gaulle Airport. That's the sad discovery French customs officers have just made. This highly lucrative trade in endangered species, which is difficult to eradicate, is the struggle of our guest, Ophir Drory. He's one of the founders of the Eagle Network, which specializes in the fight against wildlife trafficking in Africa. His work has won him several international awards and led him to write a book on the last great apes. He told our journalist Edwin Karaoke in Nairobi how he discovered his vacation during a trip to Cameroon. Ophir Drory. Hello. Hello. You are the founder of Eagle, an organization of eco-activists determined to fight wildlife criminals in Africa. And somehow, it all started in 2003 with you meeting a little Cameroon chim called Future. What happened? Mm. Well, I, uh, it all started when I arrived to Cameroon as a journalist, in fact. Uh, I was following a lead by Jane Goodall, the primatologist that if we do nothing about the illegal trade in apes meat, uh, we're going to lose great apes within 20 years and, and many other uh, um, protect the animals for the illegal trade, um, the international illegal trade. Um, and I, I started this article following this lead and in fact it was pretty easy for me to, sh to see how this illegal trade is rooted not in poverty, um, or in small villages, but actually it is uh, driven by the rich and the powerful. In fact, it was the same wildlife officers and police officers in charge of enforcing a law that existed uh, that gives up to three years imprisonment to anyone even holding a chimp. It was the same ones, to, the same people who are in charge of enforcing the laws that were actually driving the trade, running the trade in the first place. So, of course, corruption was the big thing. And I was finishing maybe three quarters of an article showing the link between um, the international illegal trade, very organized one, um, a law that was put in place to prevent it uh, that has not been even enforced a single time because of corruption. So all this was pretty clear and was very easy to demonstrate as, as uh, wild animals, protected wild animals were sold quite openly. Uh, and there I went to try to find the light in the end of the tunnel for my article, which is the conservation world, the NGOs. And as I went there to get some optimism to my article, uh, uh, as I went there to see solutions for corruption, for the problem of enforcement, um, I found a far bigger problem, in fact. I found uh, a very detached kind of NGO world that is talking about sensitization, talking about uh, seminars, talking about workshops, but does not want to get themselves uh, dirty with enforcement and definitely not with corruption that would put them in conflict with some big people. And that's where I stopped the article. And uh, during my research, I saw a baby chimp, baby chimpanzee called uh, baby chimpanzee that was about to die that was an orphan, uh, a, a survivor of the slaughter of, of his family. Uh, I ended up rescuing this baby chimp. And uh, at the same day where I saw this baby chimp about to die and confronted firsthand with the corruption that prevents this law from, uh, from, uh, uh, this law from being applied and also this chimp from being rescued, I, uh, I took the initiative to try to, uh, uh, to formulate what I see that is lacking in the system. And, and in that night, between seeing that baby chimp, being very frustrated from corruption and rescuing the baby chimp, I was writing down basically almost all of what we do today, uh, which is a specialized NGO in uh, wildlife law enforcement and in fighting corruption to get the law applied. I rescued this baby chimp and all that I've written in that night, I had to stay, be a, be a father and mother to this baby chimp for a while and future the baby chimp actually forced me to stay uh, and, and, and apply what I was writing, to show it's possible. 13 years after you started your first association, LAGA, in Cameroon, the Ego Network is now established in 10 African countries. What type of criminality does it fight against? 
Mm -hmm. Well, when we talk about wildlife crime, a lot of people are still thinking about poachers and poaching and some small things happening in a village. In fact, wildlife crime is the fifth largest illegal trade in the world. It's, uh, it's related to organized crime and other forms of crime, uh, as drugs trade, uh, uh, human trafficking, uh, uh, arms trafficking. All these are many times related. So we are dealing with that layer, not the layer of the poachers that are sent by the bigger traffickers, but in fact, um, international organized crime, uh, criminal rings that are uh, making a lot of money from the illegal wildlife trade. Um, uh, and uh, 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 that are activating the small, the small poachers. That is connected a lot of times with high level corruption. And that is why now, after uh, at this point of time, we, we were able to get into jail more than 2,500 major traffickers, arrested, convicted, and put behind bars. And that includes generals, that includes politicians, it includes a police commissioner, wildlife director in charge of the entire wildlife management of their country. Um, so uh, this is the real wildlife crime. It's organized crime, high level criminality connected to many other forms of uh, crimes and that is our work, to try to hunt them down um, and work with authorities uh, to make sure they are arrested, convicted, put behind bars in the face of vast corruption. While many organizations uh, specialize in advocacy work, Ego has adopted a more decisive course of action that is undercover investigations into criminal networks and following up on prosecution. How does this approach pay off? Mm -hmm. Well, indeed, it was clear to us from the beginning that um, that crisis of, of the race towards extinction of those threatened species and the lack of, of enforcement uh, acts as a justification for an NGO to take a step forward towards action, not to talk from the outside, not to talk about it, but to actually jump in, work with government in the field on the entire process, from investigations to arrest operations to the legal, uh, legal follow-up up to prisons. Um, so on the nine t countries that we have, soon to be ten, um, in each country we have a team of activists, an elite team, uh, that has four different activities. The first is investigations. We have undercover investigators. Their role is to infiltrate the trade. Infiltrate, climb up the chain, try to get not a small poachers, but the traffickers, and sometimes the bigger traffickers, and sometimes those corrupt high officials that enables that. Um, their role is to build trust with the traffickers up to a point where we can have a sting arrest operations and arrest the traffickers in the act. Now the second uh, department that we have, second activity, is the arrest operations, where we work with the authorities in the field, with the police, with wildlife officers, in the planning of these arrest operations, those sting operations, sophisticated way to arrest traffickers in the act. We are there in the field doing it with them. Next is the legal follow-up. It starts from actually the interrogations and assisting with legal advisors, the interrogations themselves, trying to get all the information from them and the charge sheet, charging them with those crimes. But it also continues to the actual um, uh, legal process, to the actual trial, and it continues up to the, up to the prison's systems. So we have, um, we're assisting the governments with lawyers, with, with advocates that represent those cases on behalf of the state. But we also fight corruption through this entire process, which means that we are intercepting corruption attempts from the arrest level up to the legal level in the, in the trial, up to the prison systems. So we even go to the extent of visiting our prisoners, visiting our prisoners once a week to see that their human rights uh, are being kept, but at the same time to see if they are there. Because Criminals that are wealthy many times can get themselves out of prisons. So we are, we are designed 
to fight corruption through this entire process. Corruption doesn't surprise us. It's not a nuisance. It is our reasons of being there and controlling it. Lots of times we have to uh, monitor and see that somebody has bribed their way out. Uh, of course, under the pretext that he escaped jail. And we work together with the judiciary very fast to kick them back in to prison where they belong. And that's how it looks like when you're designed to intercept corruption and fight corruption. Knowing that corruption is the number one obstacle for wildlife law enforcement. In fact, our statistics is that 85% of all of our arrest operations, 85%, we intercept corruption. We have corruption attempts intercepted and combated. The legal system is equally disturbing as an observation. 80% of our cases, we can, say, we can uh, tell you who was trying to bribe who, who was trying to interfere, whether it is a bribe attempt, whether it is a traffic of influence where a, a high authority that is backing up a criminal ring is trying to interfere and trying to release that person uh, from, uh, from prison, for example, or from the trial itself. Should there be more concern given the fact that your organization has unveiled many links between wildlife trafficking and international crime? Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, we're talking about organized crime. And organized crime is not doing just wildlife trafficking. Uh, so many times we, we have arrest operations in which we see those links, uh, whether it is uh, drugs trafficking, whether it is arms trafficking, whether it is human trafficking, uh, etc. I'll give an example of arrest operations that we had uh, this year, in the past few months, um, in Cameroon, where, where two different occasions, two different arrest operations with the authorities were hitting the link between wildlife trafficking and um, the illegal trade in human remains, human skeletons. And in fact, in those two crackdown operations, two different rings were arrested. It started from our investigations on ivory, in fact. But two different criminal rings were arrested, trading illegally with human remains. In one of them, it was quite uh, impressionable. The traffickers were holding two suitcases, two trolley suitcases. And in each one of them was a skeleton of a human being still with hair on, on, on his head. And when we do that, we understand that we are able to our work with, with, with governments to assist not just in fighting wildlife crime, but also uh, making a dent in trying to assist in, in other uh, criminalities that have been either unknown or untreated, and we try to help in that. Um, cyber criminality is another, uh, is another case. Uh, so a lot of times, Legal wildlife, legal wildlife trade is connected with cyber criminality and we're able to, do, uh, uh, to assist those countries in some of the first arrests ever of cyber criminals and trying to take wildlife law enforcement and the justice system to, uh, to the future where, where this will play a far bigger role. So that is what uh, brings us more satisfaction where we are able to hit uh, human trafficking, drug trafficking, cyber criminality, um, uh, legal trade in human remains uh, as a part of the work that we do. And that is because crime is crime and wildlife traffickers are traffickers first and foremost.